I'm Ray Eisen. Uh, I'm from the Open University in the UK and Monash University in Australia. Um, it's so uh, pleasing for a greyhead like me to be bookended between two young presenters in this session. Uh, I formulated my uh, period here with you this morning as a, an inquiry which I'm inviting you to join and it's framed out of my uncertainty rather than anything that uh, I feel uh, compelled or convinced to convey to you. Uh, and around the themes of the uh, conference, it's around issues of paradigm transformation, about praxis, and about some key, if you like, systemic or cybernetic concepts. And I'm going to ask you to do some small exercises, recognising that if I had more time, I would do it more interactively, and a different mode, but uh, I'm still not going to run away from the challenge of engaging you more than just through words. Uh, this is the framing for my overall talk, and I think the uh, situation that uh, in many ways this conference is trying to address. Uh, the question is, does, uh, is there a place for humans in uh, our future? The biosphere will persist. The question is, will we persist with it? Uh, it's interesting that I was going to use this slide following uh, Colin's presentation because this, to me, is an archetypal, if you like, uh, image from uh, the outplay of the Western intellectual tradition. This is the Dead Sea in uh, the border between Jordan and Israel. And I'm not sure if you know what is going on there at the moment, but the Dead Sea is falling at over a metre per annum, and that there is almost no water running into the Dead Sea at all. If you were to go to where Christ was baptised and put someone in the water, they would die. It is that polluted. And we face the very prospect of a dead Dead Sea. It's almost reached that stage already. And these are great sinkholes that are forming in the area where the Dead Sea has fallen from. You'll see the transition from brown to fawn. That's where the Dead Sea used to be. And this is an archetypal, if you like, image for all of the rivers of the world at this moment, I would contend. This is a small uh, river catchment in Italy, in the Marche region. If you go on holidays in Italy, you may have been there, and you'd probably say this is a lovely uh, landscape, a lovely scenery. But la let me interpret it for you in a different way. This uh, landscape is a product, totally, of the common agricultural policy in Europe, which has determined the farming systems that are uh, enacted on that landscape which produce forms of cultivation that go up and down the hill, rather than across the hill, that lead to very high levels of uh, soil erosion, and which through the fertiliser regimes lead to groundwater nitrates that mean that the local population can no longer drink the groundwater. They pipe water in from the Apennines some 100 kilometres away. So this landscape is a construct of our ways of thinking and our shaping us of policy. So water catchments, there are a whole set of historical framings for catchments and watersheds. Historically we've thought of them as biophysical entities or engineered or sometimes ecological entities. Sometimes we think of them as systems and use that word. Uh, much hydrology and catchment management has been driven by the concept of stationarity the idea that there is a fixed pocket in which there's no variability and that you can predict out of this uh, and model uh, and all of these things. And we've developed modes of praxis that we describe as integrated catchment management or uh, but rarely managing. Uh, and so there's a big discourse about that, but whether it's actually in grounded as a form of praxis and what it actually means, what integration means, are highly problematic. Of course, we live in a world as well where water is by and large in the, treated as a commodity rather than part of a cycle or a vital set of life processes. Helen Ingram uh, from uh, the US, who's devoted a lifetime to working in water governance, claims that attempts to design water-improved 
improve water resources management and institutions must attend to context. She claims in general clumsy solutions that embrace multiple perspectives and appeal to different kinds of logic are preferable. Mixed strategies that appeal to different ways of knowing are likely to be more effective, she claims. So how might we respond to these particular circumstances? And in a way this uh, question is a question about purposefulness which was raised by Nora in her talk on Monday night and by Jerry Brown as well in his uh, uh, reflections. And it's also a question about governance, again, that Jerry Brown referred to uh, on Monday evening. So let me just uh, put before you what I understood Jerry's concept of governance, which resonates with my own. Governance is responding to feedback, can be understood as a cyber systemic concept from the word kybernetes, kybernetes meaning helmswoman or steersman. And governing is thus responding to feedback or charting a course in response to purpose, and of course the, the idea that winds and currents uh, are, are, are how one interprets those and responds uh, are central to this idea of governance. So my invitation to you, which goes beyond this particular session and into the rest of the conference and beyond, is to um, assist in the systemic inquiry into how we might do water river, catchment, watershed governance more effectively into the future. And in particular, what I'm uh, posing today is what constraints and possibilities does a conception of rivers uh, as the structural coupling of two systems, the human and the biophysical, offer to praxis innovations and that offer an effective break with the dualistic thinking and acting that is pervasive in this domain. And this, to me, is a case study of a broader question about how we, as a species, might sustain an ongoing relationship with a biosphere which is viable for us and other species. And I'm not going to unpack what I mean by viable, but... Here's an image, in a sense, of what I'm inviting uh, you to consider. The business-as-usual approach that we live in at the moment in is built on certain foundations of governance, thinking, practice, institutions and investment patterns which I contend are no longer a sound foundation for moving into the future. So the invitation is how do we reinvent governance, thinking, practice, institutions and investment to build a new foundation for moving forward. Now, to set off this inquiry process that I'm inviting you to join, I want to uh, reflect on an experience I had earlier this year at a big conference in London called Planet Under Pressure. There were 3,000 scientists present, another 3,000 people participating online, and it was a precursor to uh, Rio Plus 20. And here's a word, uh, Wordle, uh, if you like, uh, done on the um, conference uh, policy briefs that were formed, as well as from uh, participants from the South, voices from the South, and so the scientists in their, pre, in their policy briefs at the top, people from the South uh, at the bottom, and so you'll see the uh, disparity of interests and key words, and you'll see at the top how systems features as the key uh, word in that context, and how at the bottom no was a, a quite a high... Uh, frequency occurrence. Now, my reflection on this conference, that despite the w use of the word systems, 80% of the people who used the word systems did so unreflexively and without any context of its praxis implications or of its history of, or, uh, in terms of its lineage and intellectual lineage. And that's, uh, in a way, uh, an issue we all uh, face and it's uh, emerged here in this conference as well. Now, one of the concepts that got bandied around a lot at that conference was the idea of a social ecological system as an alternative, if you like, framing for how we need to go forward. And uh, this has uh, been particularly pursued through the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And I want to... Um, give you a, a little exercise around this concept. You may not have encountered it, but it shouldn't be hard to do the exercise. If I give you a little basket of tools, 
to use in this exercise circles, arrows and words, that's your basket of tools, can you just draw a conception, a conceptual model of a social ecological system, as you imagine it might be? Now do it very quickly, do it in your head if you have to, but on paper would be even better. So just take this notion of people in language talk about a social ecological system. What is it you think that they're talking about? Now let's do that in a little diagram, a little using these tools. I'm not going to give you much time because I don't have much time. So, all right, you've given it a bit of thought, a moment's thought. Let me give you a field guide to potentially different models of the way you might have answered this question. And as I go through, put up your hand if you had this model. Some uh, emerging in language at the moment is the idea of an earth system. You could have had that as your bigger framing. And you could have seen a social ecological system as a system in its own right. Uh, or part of an earth system. You may have seen it as an overlapping set between social system and ecological system, number three. Anyone? Got, have I got there yet with anyone? Or are you all different places? Yeah, more or less. Okay, someone might have seen the social system as a subsystem of an ecological system. Okay, so quite a few people there. This one's a bit perverse. They may have seen the ecological system as a subsystem of the... Social system, but why not? Uh, some might have seen it as an interacting uh, of two systems, social system or ecological system. Or some might have seen it in terms of a co-evolutionary dynamic unfolding over time between two systems, which is model number seven. And of course, you may have come up with completely different ones that I haven't even imagined. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I'd love, I'd love to explore those with you later. But I did this exercise uh, a few weeks ago in the Stockholm Resilience Institute, which is the home of the concept of social ecological systems, and gave this exercise to the people present, and we came up with at least three different conceptions of it in the home of its generation, which is interesting, I think. Now, to get your head around the next... Uh, but I'm going to give you a little exercise. It's a mental exercise. I owe it to Umberto Macarana. Uh, 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 if I ask you to think about how walking arises as a practice, so if I ask you how does walking as it rises as a practice, many of you will know because you've experienced Umberto ask the same question, but some of you may not. If I had time, I'd allow a discussion about this, but I'm going to go straight to the uh, answer I'm looking for. In a way, if I use this spy hook to pull myself up and move, continue to move my legs, then walking as a practice wouldn't arise, because walking as a practice arises in the recursive dynamics between two systems, me as an organism and a medium, the floor. And in a way, this is a... Same, this is a manifestation of Gregory Bateson's invitation to think of the hand as a set of relationships. I prefer it because it has an embodiment element that that other one doesn't. And I use this in my teaching uh, or, or my presentations because we are wedded to answering this question in linear causal ways. And all of the answers I get most of the time are not the answer I've just given you, but are all causal or, or something else. I'm going to be out of time very quickly. Okay. But I need you to think about this because it comes to the idea of how we understand systems. I contend that we have a choice about how we understand systems. We can see systems as things in the world, as ontologies, which is the common sense, if you like, the everyday way it tends to get used unreflexively. Uh, or if you've got a commitment to a positivist uh, worldview. Or you can say it's best to start with a situation and how we engage with a situation and use systems as epistemological devices to engage with situations, to see systems as ways of knowing the world. 
And I contend those are choices we have and that we are not uh, sufficiently rigorous or reflexive about how we make those choices. And if we think about the key aspects of system, a system is always brought forth by someone and in bringing forth a system we distinguish a relationship, not a thing, I contend. We distinguish a system, environment, relationship that is mediated by a boundary judgment. So just as the walking is a recursive dynamic, then I would contend the praxis of doing systems is bringing forth relational dynamics as ways of knowing and engaging with the world. And for an aware systems practitioner, a system of interest is an epistemological device, a way of knowing about a situation, and it has connections to purpose and to purposeful action. Now, I mentioned the word structural coupling in that model. How does structural coupling work? And I owe uh, uh, Pillay Bunnell for these uh, figures. Um, essentially, uh, the walking model is uh, uh, an exemplar of like how structural coupling works. A self-composing system coupled to a medium, medium and maintaining that coupling over time. But as you think about this uh, dynamic, I'd ask you to think about the shoes I'm wearing. And think about perhaps Hopkins' poem, a line in his poem when he says, nor can foot feel being shod as a way of thinking about what we invent to mediate our relationship with our medium. As an example of how structural coupling, I mean, structural coupling is maintained over time in a co-evolutionary dynamic or it breaks down and viability is lost to lose structural coupling. Here's a, a, another way, a metaphorical way, um, again, I owe Pili Bunnell thanks for this figure, and we, it raises questions about how we build institutions, craft institutions and build designs which mediate our dynamics. So, um, out of time, um, I'll leave you with this question. Can a systemic governing praxis be built? And what would we have to experience to claim we had experienced systemic governing?